welcome back to a, another episode of Thinking Critically. Today, I am joined by Dr. Walter Sinnott Armstrong, who is a Chauncey Stillman Professor of Practical Ethics in the Department of Philosophy and the Keenan Institute for uh, Ethics at Duke University. Uh, he's core faculty at the Duke Center for Neuroscience, Cognitive Neuroscience and has a secondary appointments in the Duke Law School, as well as psychology and neuroscience department. Uh, he earned his BA from Amherst College and his PhD from Yale. He's published widely on ethics, empirical moral psychology, and neuroscience, philosophy of law, epistemology, philosophy of religion, and informal logic. His articles have appeared in a variety of philosophical, scientific, and popular journals. His current work is on political polarization, scrupulosity, moral psychology, and brain science, as well as uses of neuroscience in legal systems. And last but not least, how I found him is he has a number of popular Coursera courses on reason and argument. Anyway, Walter, that's quite the introduction. Uh, list of accomplishments, welcome. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have you on the show today. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your interest in my work and I look forward to talking with you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so first off, right out the gates, I really wanted to kind of get a background on how it is that you found yourself interested in philosophy in the first place. So I think that one of the big uh, factors in life is the people we run into. And I was lucky enough to run into a professor when I was an undergraduate uh, named Bill Kinnick, who uh, really turned me on to philosophy and made me see its value and its interest. And the way he did that is kind of interesting too. He did it by giving me a D on my very first philosophy paper. Okay. He made me angry at first. <clears throat> and I made an appointment. I, I got to talk to this guy. I got to go to his office hours. But when I got to his office hours, he explained to me why I was lucky to get a D. And I left thinking, boy, I can learn from this person. So I think one lesson for that is you can really learn from the people that show you you're wrong. If they tell you why you're wrong, not if they just yell at you, but if they give you reasons, then it can you know, make you become interested in them and recognize how much better you can be as a person if you take those criticisms and arguments seriously. Yeah, so that's really, really interesting that you say that. Uh, in particular, that they tell you why you're wrong. I mean, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, the the constructive feedback aspect of it of that is is really really important. So this pro this professor, you know, he told you that you're wrong. He gave you a D, and then this this is what snowballed into your whole philo um, philosophical journey. Then, like you're like, yeah, hey, I want, this is what I want to do. Yeah. After that, I took every course I could with him because I realized that I could learn from him. Uh, and I did learn an awful lot. Uh, and by the end of my college career, uh, I had become a philosophy major. I didn't start out as a philosophy major. I'd been a scientist before that. Uh, but when I met this one inspiring teacher, uh, it really turned me in a new direction. That's interesting. So uh, you said you were going down the science route before that. I'm curious, what science did you study? Uh, basically, physics and chemistry. In okay. high school, I was the chairman, or the I guess the president of the uh, of the science of the physics and chemistry club, and uh, arranged things. I had worked on computer programming, uh, and I'm now I'm back to doing moral artificial intelligence. Uh, but back then, I was programming computers. This was 1972, 73. Uh, I was already programming a computer at the school I went to. Uh, but um, didn't have any idea what philosophy was uh, until I got to college, really. Yeah, so once you, uh, you kind of got a taste for philosophy, you're like, this is it, this is what I want, this is what I want to do, and you departed from science then and went down that route. And right, it, because yeah. I think the main thing was philosophy was dealing with the issues that really mattered to me. You know, I was interested in the origins of the universe, and I was interested in the meaning of life, and I was interested in you know, what was right and wrong, and philosophy approaches those big issues, uh, whereas other fields sometimes skirt around them uh, and don't address them head on and try to solve these major problems in our lives. 
Well, I suppose for one, like going to the example that you said with the right and wrong, like how does how does science give us morals and values? I mean, I don't like I don't. I, to me, that seems like it's outside of even being formulating like a testable hypothesis. Uh, you know, does can you derive ethics essentially from scientific laws? And I think the answer to that is no, as of right now. <laughs> no, I, don't know I agree. If, yeah. That's the point. Science can't cannot help you answer those. Now, science can help in a very important way. It can help you understand why other people hold such different views. I got interested in ethics because I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee during the Vietnam War. And there were big ethical issues about whether we ought to be in that war. And also during the civil rights movement. And there were fights on the streets and, and protests right and left about uh, not just uh, rights for African-Americans, uh, but for women, for gays, and so on. These were all big issues in my life when I was growing up. And I was struck by the fact that some really good people uh, held views that I just thought were horrible. Yeah. And did things, did actions that I also thought were horrible. So the example I love to mention is there was one church in Memphis, I won't name it, but they had a wonderful program for helping uh, mentally retarded youth. And I wanted to do that. And so I went to this church. It was not the church I normally attended, uh, but they had this great program. And it was just a wonderful program. It was helping these needy kids. It was reaching out to help the, the community, their parents, and, and so on. It was a great program. They seemed like such nice people. And then one weekend, this, this is a church with about, I would guess, three, maybe four or 5,000 seats in the, in the sanctuary. Uh, one weekend, a black couple walked in the back of the church, and two-thirds of them stood up and walked out. And I just okay. thought, whoa, <laughs> how could these people who are so concerned about mentally retarded youths and families that, that have mentally retarded children, how could they be so insensitive to African Americans when these people are want to join their church and are good people too? So how does yeah. that happen? How does somebody hold such seemingly contradictory, at least conflicting views? That's where science can help because science can tell us what causes us to hold the beliefs that we do. And then that can help us understand those beliefs, deal with those beliefs, and maybe turn them in a more constructive direction. Absolutely. And so these experiences from your childhood, um, seeing what happened in the uh, church, the Vietnam War, uh, women's rights, homosexual rights, like this really, really influenced you um, to go down the path of ethics. And I'm curious as to what aspects of ethics are you interested in now? Like, what do you do research in? What have you done research in? And uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I've, I've done research on a hundred different aspects of ethics because ethics is so complex that you need to look at individual areas of morality, not ethics as a whole. That's one of my mantras in the labs that I run. I run three labs. One's on moral artificial intelligence. How do you program morality into computers? Uh, but also what are the moral and ethical issues regarding privacy or safety or justice that are raised by developments in AI? The other lab is on um, political polarization. How do we deal as a society with conflicting moral beliefs where some people you know, think that uh, homosexuality is wrong and others think that it's beautiful because it's a form of love? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the third uh, area is, uh, is just a general lab. And there, uh, it's, called the, um, it's called Mad Lab, Moral Attitudes and Decisions Lab. And uh, there, a lot of the projects come from students. I have students come to me and they say, I'd really like to find out more about this. And I say, okay, let's talk about that. How, how, how do you do that? How do you find out about that? Now, you're a philosopher, let me hook you up with a scientist. Or you're a scientist, let me hook you up with a philosopher. 
and we form teams and do projects. But that lab's all over the place. We do all kinds of things. Uh, we do psychiatry, we study scrupulosity, which is a form of OCD obsessed with morality. We study moral judgments of immigrants and refugees as opposed to, um, as opposed to uh, people in your society who are not immigrants uh, or refugees. We study um, different areas of morality and how they differ. Uh, you know, for example, someone thinking that cannibalism is wrong uh, versus somebody thinking that rape is wrong. In what ways are they similar and what ways are they different? Uh, and so a lot of those projects just come up, kind of trickle up from the bottom from students. And my job is to help them answer the questions that they think are important and that they want to pursue. So that's why my projects are on a number of different aspects of morality. Let me mention one more because I've left that one out, and that's free will and moral responsibility. A lot of our work is about when do you hold people responsible for actions that you think were wrong or for actions that inadvertently or on purpose led to harm to other people. That's a big theme in the lab as well. And we're looking at the neuroscience and psychology of decision making. So that one, when it comes to how do you decide when somebody has done something wrong, I can see that having profound implications, particularly in the legal system. Uh, in particular, like, you know, what do we decide is inappropriate behavior and requires, you know, legal action for society to say, not only to say this is wrong, but then that we should punish you for it. So this, I can see, I can definitely see that. I, so a also, contemporary example of that is, you know, not wearing masks during COVID-19. It's a great example, yeah. What's your moral judgment of that? Some people think, hey, it's completely up to you. Others think it's morally wrong, but it shouldn't be illegal. And others think we ought to have a law against it. There are a number of different views on that issue. Uh, and it's fascinating to study what leads people to adopt the views that they hold on that issue. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been interesting, you know, going back to the COVID-19 and the, and the mask issue that individual states have handled it differently. Like some states, there's a fine, other states, there's not. Some states, it's mandatory. And of course, the states where it's mandatory, that's where you often see the fines. And in other states, it's still not a mandatory requirement to wear a mask. And it's just been really interesting to see how on a state-by-state -state basis, the ethics of mask wearing has really played itself out. And to watch it on social media, too, the way that people have uh, responded to it and created incent incentivized videos and things of that nature in order to encourage people to wear masks. And unfortunately, some of them, it's even uh, shaming, uh, online shaming for those who choose not to wear masks and whatnot. But uh, it's, been, it's been really interesting to watch it play out. And what we don't know, which I think we need to know, and, and I know some people who are working on this, is which of those most messages is most effective? So in the 1918 Spanish flu uh, epidemic, for example, there was a lot of shaming, as you mentioned. People who were not obeying the regulations were called slackers and criticized for being the kind of person they were. And there was public shaming of that. And does that work? Another uh, example is the Queen of England gave a wonderful speech about how we have to comply with the regulations. And she said, you want to think about what it will be like five years from now when you look back on how you behaved during this pandemic. And you want to act now so that five years from now, you'll be proud of what you did. That's a different kind of message. It's not shaming. It's appealing to your own sense of self-image. On the other hand, you're going to endanger yourself as a message. You're going to endanger other people as a message. Which of those messages is most effective? Uh, we don't really know. That's going to require a lot of research, and a lot of it's going on right now. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see which message then floats to the top. Um, off the top of my head, I would think the, the self-reinforcing, um, your legacy, because people are very, I think on average, very concerned about their self-image and the legacy that they leave. So I think that, that that one might actually be the winner. Of course, I'm just speculating, so we'll have to wait and see when the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, when the research becomes available. You know, scientists, uh, scientists often say, I don't want to speculate, I'm going to wait till the data comes in. But on the other hand, they form hypotheses in advance too. And so yeah. you've got a good hypothesis, now what we need to do is go out and test it. 
Precisely. Yeah, that's a scientific method, right? Hypothesize and go and test and see which one yep. floats, see which yep. wins and which ones don't. They call uh, anyway, them hypotheses just, instead of guesses, but they're really just guesses. That they are, but we scientists like to refer to them as high, as educated guesses, right? Exactly. And uh, we don't want to just say guess because guess saying guess kind of diminishes the importance of that particular question. But right. at the end of the day, it is kind of guesswork. Uh, anyway, I just want to circle back to the work that you've done on AI. Um, the ethics with uh, artificial intelligence. I'm super curious as to the work that you're doing in this area because while well, artificial intelligence is already available, it's not like self-aware, but um, you know the machine learning al algorithms and thing things of that nature. So I'm curious if we could talk a little bit about the research that you're doing in this particular area. So I think there, uh, there are two um, goals to it. One is theoretical and one is practical. So. Let me start with a theory and we'll come back to how it affects practice. But one of the insights that I've gotten from moral philosophy is that uh, when people judge an action, they have certain features of that action in mind. Not everything's relevant. You know, the eye color of the person who did the act is not relevant. Uh, and the eye color of the person who was harmed by the act is not, not relevant. But whether they knew that it was going to have that harmful effect, well, that knowledge, that is relevant to how we judge the person. So some features are relevant, some features are not. So what we do in our method is we do a survey of large numbers of people, because I don't want to necessarily impose my views on other people. So let's find out what their views are. Which features do you think are relevant to a particular decision? As an example, take a kidney exchange or just to stick with COVID-19, who gets a ventilator when two people need it and there's only one that's available, right? Which features of those patients should determine who gets a ventilator or who does not get a ventilator? And we do surveys to find out which features people think are relevant. Then we test them, again, an empirical test to see whether in fact those features uh, are endorsed by people as relevant and after adding some of our own. Then we create conflicts where the, the, where the features of people conflict. So one patient maybe is younger, which means for some people at least, maybe they ought to have a little priority in getting the ventilator. But on the other hand, the older person has dependent children or dependent parents. And so you're helping more than just that one person by giving them the ventilator and the other person doesn't. So now, how do you weigh those features against each other? We find that out by creating these conflicts and asking people who ought to get the ventilator in that case. Then we use a machine learning algorithm to predict, to, uh, to construct models of their moral reasoning. And we test it by predicting what they would say on new dilemmas that we hadn't asked them before. Uh, so now we've got a model of their moral reasoning and of course, if you do that for enough people, I can find out, well, what do people in North Carolina think? Do they think the same way as people in California or people in China you know, or people in Zimbabwe or wherever? Uh, and if we can compare different people and the kinds of algorithms, we can project what a group will decide. And here's the important thing, because a lot of people criticize this part of the project by saying, yeah, but you're just gonna get everybody's prejudices. No, actually, we also ask them which features should not affect who gets a kidney. And we can take those features out. So you just hear patient A has these features, patient B has these. You don't hear what race they are. You don't hear what gender they are. You don't hear whether they're gay or straight. And so you cannot use that as a basis for your decision. And that way, we can correct for some of the biases. Not all, There's, that's tricky. We can also correct for ignorance by seeing how their judgments are affected if they knew more about the situation. Uh, and we can, of course, avoid uh, confusion and interference with inappropriate emotions uh, because the computer's not gonna have those. So we end up with a, with a prediction of what the person would say about the moral case if they were informed, not confused, not overly or inappropriately emotional and not biased. Now that doesn't guarantee we're gonna get it right, but it does mean that, that the computer program can avoid a lot of the mistakes that people make. I'm happy if I can avoid most of the mistakes. I've given up trying to reach perfection and finding you know, the truth that's gonna be right for everybody. 
but avoiding these mistakes is going to be extremely useful. So that's the more kind of general, I, I would say, theoretical project. And it can get applied in a number of cases. So for example, uh, courts deciding who gets um, bail, who gets released before trial, and who has to wait in jail until their trial comes. That's all a prediction that weighs these different features and has to weigh them against each other. Well, a program like this could be useful in a context like that, uh, as well as in medical context, military context, and a number of the different areas where artificial intelligence is starting to be used. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting that, well, going back to the, uh, to the medical ethics that you're talking about with like who gets a ventilator and who doesn't. Uh, I mean, that's particularly relevant to current world events. And I'm just curious, I mean, have you, do you often work with areas of medical ethics or is it predominantly, you know, other areas, is it like completely mixed? I mean, I, I know that you said there's military applications and things of that nature to the ethics. Is it very, very diversified as far as what you focus within that particular lab? Um, using the AI, or is it, you know, diversified? It's diversified. Uh, yeah. I certainly am interested more in medical ethics and, le and questions of legal ethics, including criminal law, uh, than other areas. So uh, that's probably the emphasis. But we also have people come and talk about military ethics, we have a member of the lab who focuses on business ethics. Uh, and of course, we're all interested in general ethics, like just promise keeping and truth telling and dealing with your friends and family in the everyday world. And I think that is a feature of the lab, not a bug. That's a good thing because you learn more about medical ethics by comparing it to legal ethics or comparing it to business ethics or comparing it to military ethics. If you just focus on one area of ethics, you're gonna get a distorted and incomplete view. Yeah, I could see you almost, if you focus on one area, you create like a, like a bubble or an echo chamber for yourself. You're not exposing yourself to other areas where you know, there could be good ideas that you could pull into this particular focus of ethics. So for example, when you find something interesting in military ethics or even legal ethics, and then you can translate that over into medical ethics and vice versa. Exactly. So, exactly. Right, that's, that's so when you're, say, it, when you're doing legal ethics and you ask, you know, should this gang member be excused uh, for doing the crime that they committed? Well, let's compare that to whether a soldier gets excused when the military commander tells them to do something uh, that's wrong. Uh, these are both people who are obeying orders from somebody above them that holds some power over them. How are they similar? How are they different? Then you're going to get a lot clearer about uh, which, you know, to what extent they're responsible for what they do. In both cases, both cases benefit. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, okay, you've made uh, you have these wonderful courses on Coursera. And that is actually how I even came to find you is that I had a gentleman on um, earlier in the show. I don't know, it was like episode like 12 or 13 or something like that. And uh, he focuses on critical thinking. One of the resources that he gave me was your Coursera course. And that's how I discovered you. Uh, anyway, I'm just curious as to like, how did you become interested in informal logic? I mean, I know that logic is going to be a part of every philosopher's education. That is something that's uh, required, uh, at least I'm assuming. <laughs> uh, but I know that uh, that's a, it's a good portion of what, it, what philosophy is, or good, sub, good subset of philosophies is, is, uh, is logic. And how did you become interested in kind of pursuing that further, I guess, from a teaching standpoint? Uh, and why did you decide like, to make these, these Coursera courses on argumentation and uh, in, informal logic in general? So, again, I think it was one of my teachers. I guess I just kind of follow my teachers like a sheep. But, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I was more interested in mathematics and formal logic uh, until I got to graduate school. It was this time. 
Uh, and I worked in formal logic, continued to work in formal logic with one of my advisors, Ruth Marcus. But my other advisor, Bob Fogelin, uh, had a textbook on informal logic and taught it as a course when I was a graduate student at Yale. It was a great course. It used to get you know, more than 500 students every term. I refused to TA in it because there was too much work, too many students. Uh, but, but later, I joined him up at Dartmouth College and taught the course with him. He and I became co-authors of the textbook, uh, which is now in its ninth edition. Uh, and so I started teaching that course. I think what attracted me was partly I got to work with Bob, I'll admit it. Bob was a great guy, I miss him very much. Uh, but in addition, it's one of those topics where you can apply it to almost anything. You know, people in every field use arguments. And so we could take students who are you know, government majors or students who are psychology majors or students who are on a sport team or students who are doing theater or reading literature and all of them could benefit from arguments. So we used to allow the students, after they'd learned about argument and taken a bunch of quizzes, they got to write a term paper on a topic of their choice. And I just learned so much from my students. You know, I never knew how big a deal it was whether people in the Bahamas were granted British citizenship. But it turns out there's some really interesting arguments on both sides and this student wrote a great paper. Or you know, should they have lights and night games at Wrigley Field? Like, I don't even follow it. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it was a great course to teach because I got to learn from the students when I asked them to come up with examples of arguments and then use the tools that I taught them to analyze each other's arguments and to talk about it. Uh, I just really loved teaching that course. And going back to how informal logic can be more or less applied anywhere. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I really wish that I would have, so I, I'm more of a hardcore, more of the hardcore science route. And I didn't really discover philosophy until like later in my career. And then once I discovered it, I just kept devouring. It was particularly um, in the logic aspect of it. Like how to, how to structure your thoughts. How does one co uh, come to form the beliefs that they do, et cetera. And uh, the reason being is that I have a bit of a pseudoscientific history where I embraced some views that were, were counter to the uh, scientific consensus, for example, uh, vaccine safety and genetically modified food safety. And that's hard to say as a scientist, but I had convinced myself, uh, it was mostly because I had a parent who strongly believed in it and I kind of was raised into that a little bit. And it was, it, was, it was hard for me at one point to admit to myself that, you know, that I was wrong and Part, part of that, part of working through all of that was actually discovering philosophy and logic and how to structure one thoughts. And in particular, informal logic, uh, the argumentation. Um, I found that incredibly valuable. And how do you structure a good argument? And uh, it, it has struck me as how many people walk around, I mean, myself for a long time included, as a scientist, and they don't, they don't have this skill set. They don't, they don't know that these things are available. I mean, the, the, it's not taught in K through 12, at least uh, it wasn't in my, uh, in my education, K through 12. And I think on average, most people don't learn these things. And I don't really understand why. Uh, we are taught mathematical logic, um, you know, two plus two is equal to four, four, plus, four times six is equal to 24, et cetera. But we don't learn philosophical logic. You know, if, I, if I went into a room and I started asking people, give me the definition of what an argument, argument is, uh, you, you'd probably get various answers. If I went around the room and said, hey, what's two plus two, they would all give me four. At least I would hope so. Uh, but the lack of a definition on what exactly an argument is, is uh, an issue, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. And philosophy has an answer to that uh, through informal logic of what it means to form an argument. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think it's incredibly valuable and I think it's, I haven't gone through your Coursera courses, but I can imagine, and, you know, we were talking about how over the course 
um, of the course of the history of all the courses that you have on Coursera in this particular area that you've had over a million people subscribe. So that gives me, that, that, that makes, me, uh, makes me smile, gives me optimism about, uh, about informal logic getting out there and impacting people's lives positively. I mean, I, I firmly believe, and I don't know how you feel about this, but I mean, you know, it, society in general would benefit if more people learned informal logic learned that, how to structure exactly, a, good, a good argument, yeah. That's exactly why I did the Coursera course. You know, these Coursera courses, you know, it's, it's one thing, oh, let's just videotape some lectures and put them up on the internet. Well, my course is not like that. We have skits, you know, that we reenact. We have, uh, you know, kind of things going on in the background and music, and we took videotapes of people being confronted in various ways to see how they react. And it's filled with a whole bunch. It took forever to create this course. Um, but the reason I put all that effort into it is exactly what you said. This, these types of skills are not generally taught in high school and middle school, where I think they ought to be taught right from the start. Uh, furthermore, when somebody finishes college and they go out in the world, they don't have a way they can learn that. Well, that, those days are over, thanks to the internet. Places like Coursera and other platforms that have uh, courses online, you can continue to learn for the rest of your life and it doesn't cost you anything. You can, if you don't need the certificate, you don't need to pay. Uh, so I, we have students who are 11 years old taking our online course. We have students in their 80s. We have students in the United States. Brazil seems to be crazy about our course. I don't know why. Uh, you know, but. <laughs> India and, uh, and, but Afghanistan and people from all over the world of all ages, all socioeconomic, um, I could never reach those courses without the help of the internet. So I'm a big fan of these MOOCs, these massive open online courses, because they're opening up opportunities to people around the world that don't otherwise have access to methods of into ways that they can learn the skills that they need in their everyday lives. Yeah, the, uh, the internet is a wonderful tool uh, for that, particularly giving access to individuals that normally wouldn't have it to really valuable information. Right, like a podcast like yours, yeah. Yeah, precisely. There you go. Uh, unfortunately though, uh, with all of the access to information, so this is where we're highlighting the, the light side of it all, right? Uh, but there's a darker side too. Uh, for example, how easy it is for conspiracies to proliferate, how easy it is for people to get stuck in their own echo chambers online. And I'm curious as to your thoughts on how, how your course in informal logic can help people to actually like think better. So I, uh, for me, one aspect of critical thinking, what I promote as critical thinking is to come to master all aspects of informal logic, because I think, you know, out of the two areas of logic, formal versus informal, I think that informal is easier for people to digest in general, and that it's more applicable to everyday life um, versus like formal or symbolic logic. But um, circling back here, yeah, like how do you, you know, we have access to all this information, uh, some of it wonderful, such as your open online course on uh, informal logic, but some of it is dark too. Uh, there. You know, again, the conspiracy theories, uh, getting stuck in echo chambers, and these uh, fake experts and things of that nature. How does a course uh, such as yours in informal logic or informal logic in general benefit people to just think better, uh, to be able to recognize, let's say, some of these online charlatans and things of that nature? Well, I think to in avoid those types of problems, you really need three things. You need certain methods. Uh, you need, you know, you need some kind of help and you need motivation to seek out those methods and that help. Uh, so the methods are what my course tries to teach. It, it teaches you to take a paragraph of text. You know, people read way too fast. Like, let's read a 300 page book by next week. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> let's focus on this particular paragraph and ask what is going on in that paragraph? in that argument, in that tweet maybe, uh, to figure out how the different claims that are being made link up and form an argument. So we try to teach you to look at things slowly and carefully, almost through a microscope, 
to figure out what the argument actually is. And that's a big part of it. Just figuring out yeah. what the argument really is and reconstructing it in a sympathetic way. Then, so like translating it, you're essentially yeah. like, so looking exactly. at what somebody says and then reorganizing it into, you know, premise one, premise two, premise three, conclusion type of deal. Right. We teach okay. something called standard form and then you try to put the argument in the op-ed into an argument in standard form and then, and then analyze take the different parts and, and evaluate them. And so we teach both deductive standards of evaluation and inductive standards of evaluation. So it's like, how do you tell what, whether to trust a poll, a political poll or, or not? Uh, but then, uh, and something on some bits on probability, just basic probability. Uh, but probably the most, uh, one of the most important parts of evaluating is to identify common errors. If you can just avoid the most common errors, your arguments won't be perfect, but they will be a lot better. Uh, and so we try to teach fallacies, uh, both fallacies, say, on, in probability, uh, in assessing probabilities, but also more general fallacies um, that people are succumbed to in arguments. So you learn those methods of analyzing it and evaluating it using standards that apply to your arguments as well as other people's arguments. What's not fair is to take some standards and apply them to other people and not apply them to yourself. So that comes to the second issue, motivation. You want people to be motivated, not to show that they're right and that the other people are wrong. You want them to be motivated to find out the truth and to figure out which argument really is stronger uh, because they have to have that motivation in order to use these tools properly. It's not fair to attack others as committing fallacies without asking whether you yourself are committing fallacies. Right. Uh, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And the I really love what you said there about the goal is more or less what you said, like the goal is not to win, but to get closer to truth. Um, that's yeah. definitely one of the things that I promote as well. Uh, my platform is that when you enter into a discourse, your your goal isn't to win. Um, you're kind of in this dance with this other person who's going to help you to get closer to truth. And then both of you should actually be better at the end of it. Yeah. So the last thing I think you need is you need some help. It's almost impossible to do it alone. Uh, and in particular, you need help from other people. So w we try to teach people in our course that when you have an, when you see an argument, like you read an op-ed in a newspaper or you get a tweet on some feed, then turn to other people, ask them what they think about it. Because Sometimes you'll go, that seemed really convincing to me. And they'll go, no, that's not convincing. And here's why. And you go, what was I thinking? You know, <laughs> I, I can't believe that I was fooled by that. Other people can be extremely helpful, especially other people who usually disagree with you. So you need to create an atmosphere where you can seek help from people who disagree with you in order to ask them not just their position, but why they hold their position. And then you can assess their arguments in a charitable way, figure out what their reasons are, and then you can learn from them. That I think is one of the best um, safeguards against the most common errors, such as getting fooled by a website. Ask a friend who disagrees with you to go check out the website and then tell you what they think about it and then really listen to them. If you want to find out the truth, you got to really listen to them, not jump all over them because they didn't quite say it right the first time. So I really like what you were saying about getting help. And that is absolutely important, right? I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to get stuck in a bubble or an echo chamber where you're only talking to people whom you agree with. Uh, I mean, obviously, this can be helpful sometimes, particularly if like, you're stuck on a problem or you need like a second opinion on the credibility of a source or something of that nature. But also the aspect of what you talked about, how communicating with people that you don't agree with, you know, stepping outside of your comfort zone and having perhaps an uncomfortable conversation, at least in the beginning, uh, because your, you know, your, your worldview or your beliefs may get challenged. But this is something after you do it, uh, for a while, you actually become more accustomed to it, you get used to it, and you actually welcome it because 
I think in my opinion, in my experience, like th these are tremendous learning uh, times to learn. When you're talking to somebody that comes from a, a different background, doesn't necessarily believe the things that you do, uh, and then they, they talk to you and they present the world in a perhaps maybe even a, you know, a completely, adjacent, uh, completely adjacent way. And you're like, wow, I never thought about it that way. And you know, perhaps you'll move your position and perhaps they'll move theirs based off of what you're saying. But that like is super important. And I think that in, I think in today's world, particularly in the online, you know, this is probably something that's always been an issue is people only wanting to be around individuals who agree with them um, for social harmony. But in, uh, particularly online, uh, the algorithms are almost designed to do that. So it's really, really easy to be fed material that agrees with you, uh, to be fed uh, material where you know, you're only exposed to um, posts by people who share the same, let's say for example, political philosophy that you do, or perhaps um, you know, the same products or something of that nature. Uh, I think that's I think that's a bit dangerous. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, um, as far as being stuck in a an echo chamber or a bubble, or polarization sure. in general. Let's say. So, uh, well, let's stick with the internet first. Okay. Uh, and then I'll go to polarization in general. Um, the internet is a tool. Tools can be used for good or for ill. I mean, that's just an old lesson that we got to get used to. Yes, the internet can be used in ways that create problems by creating internet bubbles and never having to communicate with anybody outside of your own uh, particular tribe. Uh, but on the other hand, the internet creates great opportunities for reaching people you disagree with. They might not be living in your neighborhood. They might not go to your schools. They might not work for your business, but you can still get in touch with them. If you wanna know what people in China believe, you can do it now. And you could not do it before the internet. It was very difficult to find out what people in China thought. But now you can check it out. So there's great opportunity there as well. And I think that what we need to do is to start using the internet as a tool to solve these problems uh, regarding argument that we were talking about, rather than to view it as the enemy that has to be opposed. MOOCs are a good example. You could not have a MOOC before the internet. So the internet made that possible. I'll mention another example, which is more relevant to polarization. Uh, we're creating an online app where you can play a game. It's like an escape room game where you have to form a team with people that you know hold different political views than you do, but you have to communicate and understand and work together uh, with these other people in order to escape that room and get to the next room. And then it's gonna be a series of rooms. And the hope is that by working with these people and seeing how they can um, help you and you help them, that they cease to be the enemy. They instead become somebody that you can work with for a common goal. This is spearheaded, by the way, by Hannah Reed, one of my grad students. She should get credit for that. But, but the idea is let's use apps, let's use the internet to overcome the problem uh, but while recognize that when used inappropriately, it can make the problem worse. That's uh, no, that, that's a, that's a wonderful point, and I hope that I wasn't what, that the impression that I was giving was not that the internet was bad, but that it's certainly that there are aspects of the internet that are darker that need to be addressed. Fair enough. Uh, anyway, the that app that app idea is absolutely brilliant, particularly because, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but when like when humans bond over something, um, for example, like teamwork, they are more likely to listen to one another and open themselves up to perhaps having their beliefs changed. So not only are you doing that, you know, encouraging teamwork, but then you're doing it over, you know, discussions, uh, right. you know, listening to each other. So yeah, that's a, that's a super interesting this concept. Is, uh, it, I, should, it, I should say uh, Hannah's, uh, Hannah Reed's, uh, program is based on what were called jigsaw classrooms. They were instituted in the early 1970s and actually the late 60s as well uh, in order to overcome the problem of uh, integrated schools. Because when you integrated the schools, you still had tension between the white students and the black students. How do you get them to appreciate each other, understand each other, work together, 
jigsaw classrooms were invented and proven to be very successful. We're just taking that model that was used in public education and expanding it uh, to a larger scale. Okay. Uh, is it in development? Is it available? Or what's, uh, what's the... Uh, there's a beta yeah. version in development. Okay. We just got a grant to help us pay a computer programmer to polish it up. We hope that it will be available uh, nationwide uh, in September. That's fantastic. We'll definitely have to stay in touch because I'm going to, I'm definitely going to want to download that and try it because Good. it sounds really, really interesting and incredibly useful. Um, so real quick, I'm curious as to, so we've been talking a lot about having conversations with people that you don't necessarily agree with. What would your advice be for individuals who are approaching this and th they don't have a whole lot of experience uh, with having these uncomfortable conversations? They don't necessarily need to be uncomfortable, but I would say, I think it's fair to say that the average person doesn't necessarily like having their beliefs and worldview challenged. Um, that is something that we hold very close. And when it is challenged, it uh, elicits almost a fight or flight response. Um, it just feels like your heart rate, like you get flustered. Uh, the same thing like if somebody, if you were to get scared over a situation, it's like the same systems in the body uh, become activated. Like def your, defense, your defense mode becomes activated, um, even though it's just with words and it's having your beliefs and, worldview uh, and or worldview challenged. So I'm curious as to the advice that you would give people as to how to over how to work through that, uh, because I, I think that that is a critical step in becoming a better thinker, and uh, just opening your opening yourself up to have uh, conversations with people from different backgrounds that you don't necessarily agree with uh, agree with in general. I mean, there are there are a bunch of different rules that you know that I put forward in my book and in the course and so on. But I, probably the most important one is to make sure that you understand your opponent and why they believe their position uh, before you criticize it. So criticism should come very late in the game. Make sure you understand them first, or otherwise you're just going to be in a fight and you're going to miss each other. You're talking yeah. about one thing, they're talking about another thing. Uh, you don't want that to happen. And as a tool for that, a second bit of advice would be, be patient. They're not going to come out with their real reason right away. You might have to ask them three or four times. You might have to spend a long amount of time talking back and forth with them uh, before it can possibly become constructive. So don't interrupt them. Don't interject your own views and tell them you disagree. Just listen and be patient. You can ask some questions like, what exactly do you mean by that? Can you give me an example of that? Why do you believe that? Is there some you know, evidence that you've seen that that's based on? But those questions should be for clarification, for understanding. Uh, leave the criticism till way later. Most people just jump right on top and say, you're a racist or, you know, yeah. or you're a liberal or whatever. Uh, and then they just criticize each other right off the bat. It takes great patience to understand someone and to make progress. Yeah, I think that there's definitely something about forming, you know, committing to forming a bond with somebody in the beginning, like bonding over something and then really digging into the, uh, the details of the arguments being put forward before you can actually begin to, you know, rebut them or criticize them, et cetera. And I think maybe perhaps calling the other person an opponent may, may not be the best terminology. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but if we're to believe that the other person is going to help us get closer to truth, uh, and then we're not trying to defeat them, maybe we should start calling them as, a, as, our, uh, as our partner. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, what you call them is gonna vary from situation to situation. I'm not sure there's yeah. a general answer to that. I agree with you, opponent is not, the best word in most of the situations, but you know sometimes you just have to stand up to views that oh, really of course, are yeah. that horrible, and then it's a different story. It's not like there's going to be one size that fits all, but you should view them as somebody that you can learn from and that you really do want to learn from. If you don't think you have anything to learn from this person, that they cannot teach you the slightest thing about their lives or about 
you know, um, their views, uh, then why are you talking to them? Uh, you're just talking for your own self-aggrandizement to make yourself look good or to impress your friends. Treat them as somebody that you can learn from. So I would say maybe you should call them your teacher. Uh, you know, somebody who can teach you. Now you can teach them too. That doesn't mean you're not a teacher, but at first you're learning from them. That's the important, I think, perspective. And you're learning as a means to gain the truth, not as a means to gain, win a political battle or a competition or a debate tournament or anything like that. You are learning from them in order to make your own views more accurate uh, and also to learn what types of objections you need to be able to respond to and to learn all kinds of things uh, from listening to the other people. Yeah, I love that. And yeah, I, I couldn't, I definitely couldn't agree more. And it would be wonderful if more and more, if more people embrace this particular philosophy. Uh, I mean, I spend a lot of time online. I've entered into earlier what I would call debates. Now I just call them conversations with people because the goal isn't really to win anymore. When I was younger and trying to develop my argumentation skills in particular, right after I was learning, when I was learning more about informal logic, I would engage in debates essentially like on Reddit, uh, Facebook, other social media platforms. Uh, but now as I've grown a little bit more, I've come more to embrace the, the truth seeking that it's not so much a battle, but a, 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 not a, not a battle or a competition, but um, it's, it's a team comp it, it, it's a, t it's teamwork essentially to finding, to finding truth. Um, there so are, however, I, I have to add that qualification, which I mentioned before, but let me emphasize, there are people that you don't want to treat that way. I mean, if yeah. I'm dealing with a white nationalist, like an open white nationalist who says, you know, black people ought to be kicked out of the United States, I'm not a, I'm, I don't adopt the attitude, what do I have to learn from this person? And I certainly don't think that black people have to be the ones who reach out and, and uh, help solve that problem. None of that's going to apply. There are always exceptions, but yeah. those people in my experience, at least are few and far between. Instead, there are a lot of people who hold views that disagree with you that you end up calling them a white nationalist when they're really not. And if you understand and listen to them, you find out that they're not, uh, okay. but the ones that really are, uh, I think there's not much you can do with them except beat them in the polls in the yeah. election. Yeah, yeah, precisely. I mean, that, that's a wonderful point. Yeah. I mean, there are some people who whose views just should not be tolerated by society. For example, the white nationalists. Well, oh, well, um, well, I think they ought to be tolerated, you know, in the sense of they shouldn't be thrown to jail for their views. I'm a great believer in free oh, speech. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But they should not be tolerated in the sense that I should speak out against them publicly. That's my free speech. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah, that that's a very, very good distinction there. Uh, yeah, there are there are some people who are just unreasonable and unreachable, unreachable. Yeah, and don't really, waste your really, time on that. Don't waste your time. Yeah. Target your views and your arguments and your appeals to people on the middle who are much more likely to listen uh, and to and and much more likely that you can learn something from them as well. Precisely. So I suppose this is a good uh, a good point to segue into your work that you've done in political polarization. So I'm really curious to hear uh, your thoughts and ideas. I know uh, when we spoke last week, uh, we talked about political, political polarization and you're saying that, there's, that there was always polarization, that it's always kind of been around, uh, but perhaps uh, it's become hyperpolarized or it's become a little bit exacerbated because of the internet. I don't know, what are your thoughts? What, what, uh, I mean, I what think your research say? Always there's always been polarization around political issues. I mean, there were fist fights in Congress uh, in the 19th century. Uh, I grew up in the 60s and there were Molotov cocktails being thrown at government buildings and, and violent protests outside of political conventions. And, you know, there, you know, and against the Vietnam War and so on. You know, th that was political polarization. One thing that's different, I think, now is that uh, the parties have become so different from each other. When I grew up, there were liberal Republicans and there were conservative Democrats. You just don't see that anymore. And so 
uh, the polarization has uh, taken a new form, very much a, here's my tribe, I'm a Republican. Here's my tribe, I'm a Democrat. Uh, I heard something the other day when somebody just said, well, why did I attack them? And the answer is because they were a Republican. Like, whoa, whoa, like yeah. just because of your political mm -hmm. party, that's, that's a kind of polarization which I think has become more rampant. So if you look, for example, at degrees of approval uh, by each party for a president, uh, the differences used to be, you know, 30, 40% more Democrats would favor a Democrat candidate and 30, 40% more Republicans would favor a Republican. That's not surprising. But for Trump, it's, it's like 90% of Republicans, and or at least this was last year, I don't know about it anymore, but, but last year it was like 90% Republicans, you know, approve of what he's doing and 8% of Democrats. Now you're getting, you know, 80% difference between the parties where it used to be 30 or 40. So that I think, um, it, you know, is part of what's happening. And in a way, if you think about it, that doesn't bother me. I don't care if there are parties that are very different. It'd be a shame if there were no difference between the parties. People complained about that in the 60s. Uh, but but there was be, no difference? Yeah, but there was yeah. not enough difference. They were too, like, they were too similar. You're choosing okay. between two candidates that are like, you know, pretty much the same. Uh, it's nice to have distance in some, it's, it's not a bad idea that there's homogeneity, right? That the parties are more, they actually have an ideology that they're arguing for. I don't think that's bad in itself. Uh, What's bad is when they isolate from each other and don't listen to each other, when they're antagonistic towards each other, when they're uncivil to each other and you know, call each other liar during the State of the Union as happened with Obama. Uh, when they say, I just don't understand how anybody could possibly support Hillary Clinton, or I don't understand how anybody could possibly support Trump. So there's an opacity, a, a lack of understanding, and that leads to rigidity and gridlock and, and a failure of Congress to pass laws that, to help solve these problems that we all recognize. And even if we have different ways of solving the problems, uh, we ought to be able to work together on some kind of compromise. That's the real cost of polarization to me, is there are serious problems in the world and nobody's doing anything about them, right? If, if we could somehow overcome the polarization, maybe those different parts of Congress uh, could work together a little better to solve some of those problems. It ain't going to be perfect, oh. but it might do a little good. Yeah, definitely not perfect. I don't think it ever is, but it, it, it for sure needs to be better because there is no cross, cross aisle cooperation these days. It doesn't seem like, like nothing between parties seems to be able to get done. It's all apart. It's all along party lines and very few dissenters ever. Uh, and I know that you know, you were talking about the two parties shouldn't be the same. I agree, they shouldn't because we, they represent all different aspects of our society. The United States is huge. Uh, it's very complex and dynamic. Uh, people from all different, uh, all different backgrounds, uh, various views, et cetera, belief systems. So it shouldn't be the same, but it definitely is very unhealthy that it's this polarized. So I guess it's, I suppose it's about finding this Goldilocks zone where, you know, we don't have too much polarization and they're not too much alike, but somewhere where they are different, but are still able to cooperate with one another. But I think it's also a matter of providing hope. People have to believe that if I reach out to the other side, that it might work. If, you, if you've given up hope and you think, they're just not gonna listen to me anyway, they're ignorant fools, they're insane clowns, then you start thinking that way and there's no point in reaching out and listening to the other side. So I like to tell stories about cases where extreme polarization has been overcome. Okay. Uh, and one of my favorite is actually a local story right about two miles that way uh, in Durham. Uh, back in the uh, 60s, there was a, an incident where a black school burned down and they had to move the black students into um, uh, other schools, including white schools. Um, this is actually, there's a recent movie called Best of Enemies, and there was a book before that called Best of Enemies. And what happened was they need to figure out how to make this work. 
how to you know redistribute the students and change the school system to accommodate this urgent need and they set up a commission uh, and a local politician had a brilliant idea we're going to take two people and put them as co-heads of the commission Ann Atwater and C.P. Ellis and Ann Atwater was a uh, black single parent uh, who was extremely active in the local housing movement for to get better housing for poor minorities. And C.P. Ellis was the head of the local Ku Klux Klan. You could not imagine people who were more polarized against each other. Uh, they um, brought guns to, you know, he brought a gun, she uh, lunged at him one point during a meeting. They hated each other. But the politician said, look, I want you two to be co-chairs. And if one of you says no, the other one is the only chair. So now they're stuck, right? They yeah. have to. So they did it, and they met in, uh, in, at great length. This ain't going to happen quickly. We're talking eight hours a day for 10 days of meetings with local people talking about their concerns. And there was a turning point in the middle of it where Ann Atwater turned to C.P. Ellis and said, why do you not want black children in school with your children? And Steve Piella said, because I think it will ruin their education and they won't learn as much. And I want my kids to be well-educated so they can escape poverty. And Ann Atwater goes, wow, like I want my kids to be well-educated too so they can escape poverty. Now all of a sudden they're on the same side, yeah. helping each other. They have, the same, they have the same mission, yeah. And they became friends for the rest of their lives. Uh, I mean, literally, she read the eulogy at his funeral, uh, oh, wow. and they, they met like every month, at, even after this whole process was over, and supported each other. He left the Ku Klux Klan uh, because they couldn't deal with the fact that he was now friends with a black woman. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I'm not saying that it works every time, but there is hope that it will work in some cases. I'm not saying that, you know, Black people, black women ought to always reach out to Ku Klux Klan members. No, I'm saying she was a saint for doing this. I mean, I would have hit the guy when he said what he said, um, yeah. but she didn't. Uh, and so you can't expect that of anyone. But when it happens, it's a beautiful thing. And it helped the city of Durham overcome that problem. So there's hope. It can be constructive. This polarization that we're feeling now surely is no worse than that. And they overcame it. So we've got to figure out how to do it in our society today. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, uh, I, I love that. Uh, that, that. That's a wonderful, wonderful story. And it reminds me of this other gentleman. Um, I think his name's Daryl. I think it's Daryl Davis or something of that nature. Yeah, Daryl Davis is another yeah. example. Yeah, yeah. Another so, one, if you're interested, you should also, and your, your listeners should look at uh, the TED Talk by Megan Phelps Roper. Okay. She was in a, a very conservative church that thought Jews were going to hell. Uh, and she started talking to this Jewish guy and actually fell in love and they got married. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, it's amazing, you know, an extremely fundamentalist, you know, church and a, a, a Jewish kid. And they found a way to talk to each other and appreciate. Daryl Davis is a good example. There are yeah. a bunch of examples of the same sort. Uh, and all those examples give us hope that fighting against this polarization by reaching out to people and listening to what they have to say can actually do some good. And learning to ask not just what they believe, but why they believe it, because then they have to give an argument and explain their reasons. And then you understand them better. Uh, argument plays that role in it. The arguments actually help the people understand each other. They help the people reach a compromise because you know why the person holds the view they do. And you can try to come up with something that, that really satisfies both your reasons. Argument can play a big role uh, in this process of depolarizing our society. Yeah, and I, what I love most about these stories is that it does give you hope, right? Because you, know, you see a lot of political polarization um, in Washington, D.C. these days that trickles down into the general populace. So people, I mean, 
I have family members that have come onto my Facebook page and like basically yelling at me over politics and like not, not willing to have cordial conversations. And, you know, it's not just me. I've seen this with other family members too. And it's like, why, why has this happened? Why has it come to this? Why can't, why can't we just have a conversation respectfully and talk to one another? So you're definitely seeing how the polarization on DC or in DC, excuse me, um, has trickled down to the general public. But these stories you're dealing with you know, black Americans, so black men and women who are talking to members of the Ku Klux Klan and then eventually form a great relationship with them and then cause them to leave the Klan. I mean, I, like you said, I, I can't imagine a scenario where you would be more polarized than that. So there's definitely hope, uh, hope for us here in the United States still from a, from a political standpoint. And also, I think it just goes to show you the power of having a conversation, right? I mean, just being able to reach out and form a relationship with somebody that you don't agree with, and then just talking about why you believe the things that you do, uh, and then see where it goes. <laughs> so I have a suggestion for your podcast, then. You ought to have somebody on who does not believe in the power of argument and listen to what they have to say uh, that might be in opposition to, you know, some of the assumptions of your program. That's a wonderful idea. And that is definitely something that I've entertained. And I think I, uh, I think I should do that. Um, I, I have to find the right person though, because yeah. if it could, it could go wrong. <laughs> I may not even be able to get, uh, get through an entire, an entire episode. Uh, hey, depending if, you on... never, if you never did anything that you knew could go wrong you wouldn't do anything in your life this is you true. gotta take a chance that's right that's right you gotta you can't uh you can't fear the unknown you just kind of have to go for it sometimes yeah but uh anyway uh i mean it's been a wonderful conversation walter uh so before we wrap up here i know that there's a few books that you wanted to tell the audience about so the first book i would mention is my recent book called think again which is about how to analyze and evaluate arguments and the first few chapters were about political polarization and why we need arguments to solve that problem. The okay. uh, American edition is by Oxford University Press and the British edition is by Penguin uh, Publishers. Uh, then if you wanna go into more depth, I actually have a textbook that I use in, in college classes called Understanding Arguments with Bob Fogland, the person I mentioned earlier. Uh, and there's a concise edition, which we made concise because it's a lot cheaper uh, than the, the full edition. I think that would be enough for most people's purposes if you want to get some more detail about arguments uh, in general. Uh, of course, you could also go to the Coursera MOOC, uh, which is also called Think Again and has four parts. I do that with Ron Netta, my good friend from uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Yes, Duke University and Chapel Hill <laughs> do work together sometimes. And so uh, Ron's a good example of that. And we have four courses there, which you can take for free if you don't need a certificate and, and, and pay a little bit uh, if, you, um, if you want more recognition. Uh, they also have financial aid for people who can't uh, do that. And I'm starting a new course. Uh, Ram and I are starting a new course, which is gonna be audio only, no video. The Coursera has video and exercises. This is more of a podcast that you can listen to in three or four hours uh, to get the basics and then go on to the longer course uh, if you want to. That's with uh, Himalaya uh, Learning. Uh, the link is just learning.himalaya.com. Uh, that'll be available probably by the end of August. Uh, and the name of that course is going to be um, How to Argue Better. Uh, so you okay. can look forward to that. Uh, and that'll be, you know, quite inexpensive. So that'll be, um, so the, this last course that you mentioned, it's going to be in podcast form. So it's like available on Apple and other, other podcasting platforms, like something that you would find yes. like through an app or something like that? Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay, wonderful. Well, anyway, for all of, uh, all of those uh, people tuning in, Thank you so much. And all of the uh, links for Walter's books, as well as his courses, will be included in the show notes. Walter, thank you so much for stopping by. It's been an absolute wonderful, absolutely wonderful conversation.
Thank you so much. I've had a great time talking with you. Okay, fantastic. All right, until next time, everyone, take care.